hello everybody and welcome to another Deep Adaptation Forum Q&A. Uh, I'm Jem Bendel and joining me for our last Q&A of the year uh, is Charles Eisenstein. So Charles is the author of a number of books, uh, books I have actually read, uh, The Ascent of Humanity and uh, also Sacred Economics uh, and The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible and uh, his new book, Climate, A New Story, which is what uh, is why we're going to be talking today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to chat to Charles uh, for about 20 minutes and then uh, throw it open to yourselves uh, to complete an hour of Q&A with Charles. So I see lots of, lots of faces, uh, some familiar, some new. I'm really looking forward to this session. So Charles, hello, and thank you for joining hey. us. Hey, Jim. Good to be uh, talking to you again. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's been, it's been a while. I, I, I think maybe Barcelona was the last time we, mm -hmm. we met at one of your uh, events there. And, um, and we also had a lunch once before Trump was elected and you were telling me, yeah, it fits. It fits. Uh -huh. He's going to get elected. It's gonna happen, expecting yeah. it, but he's gonna... And so here we are. Um, we've, just, uh, we've just had a, an election in the UK, Boris Johnson um, being given a huge majority. And uh, do you think it also fits um, in terms of what's going on in the world? The, 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 as the years go on, I know less and less. Right. Um, I've actually been on a news fast for the last week. So, okay. <laughs> I, I, um, <laughs> I like the idea. I got to tell you, yeah. the recent election in the UK is is enough for me to think I I need an immediate news fast. So mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm with you with that. So um yeah, we it, it, it's good because then yeah, it's good to step back from the noise of what's happening, and um. So should we dive in with questions more about climate because that's. That's what I've been working on myself as well for more or less the last two years. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a feeling it's somehow going to circle back to Boris Johnson, but let's let's start with climate. Okay, see let's see, let's see. <clears throat> but um, so yeah, it's interesting that, that um, I mean, sustainability and the environmental crisis has always been something that I've been working on and that you've been working on, and and that when you came to the festival in the UK that I ran, it was also very much there. But the, the actually focusing on climate itself is and, and climate change and how that is what's happening and how that's part of a, a broader ecological crisis. Um, this is something that I think neither you or I was was explicitly talking about, and 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 we both have now. Myself with deep adaptation uh, it's since July 2018, and yourself with with your new book. I was wondering if you could say, just to make sure everyone's on the, sa on the same page here and understanding your work, say just very succinctly what, what your new story is on, on climate. What is the nature of our predicament uh, beyond yeah. just looking at, at, at carbon emissions? Yeah. Okay, so the basic, thesis of my book, or at least the launching of it, the launch point of it, is what I call the living earth paradigm that says this planet is alive. Its organs are things like soil, wetlands, forests, elephants, whales, sea turtles, plankton, insects, and every ecosystem and every species on earth. Therefore, if we want, and, and, life creates the conditions for life to thrive. Every species contributes to that. Therefore, when we destroy and degrade the ecosystems, when we eliminate apex predators, when we develop land, when we dam up rivers, when we degrade topsoil through industrial agriculture, when we clear cut forests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we are destroying the basis of life and if we keep doing that, the planet will die of organ failure. A lot of what we blame, and so this is like, this is 
Um, basically, the cause of climate derangement is everything. It's not just one thing. And that is really uncomfortable. So we take this, this deep rejection and protest against everything, and we channel it onto something that fits into our customary solution templates, which would mean find one thing that's causing all of the problems and go to war against this one thing. In that mentality, we tend to blame a lot of things on greenhouse gases that I believe are actually being caused by uh, organ degradation. So like flood drought cycles, for example, uh, even you know, when we destroy topsoil, it can no longer absorb the water, uh, it, we get runoff, we get flooding, and then there's no uh, groundwater to, to, to be transpired by the trees to extend the rainy season, um, to transport heat from the surface to the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go into all the science here, but or not now. Um, so basically, I think that, that um, what I call carbon fundamentalism or carbon accountancy, it, it's, it's like almost an outlet for a consternation and a bewilderment and a helplessness and a rage and a despair that we then, oh, okay, here's the problem and here's the solution. But uh, you know, I think that even if we cut emissions to zero overnight, if we continue to strip mine and clear cut and exterminate and poison with pesticides and chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, and electromagnetic pollution and toxic waste and pharmaceutical residue and so on, the planet is still gonna die death of organ failure. And by the same token on the hopeful side, if we can heal protect and heal and restore these damaged organs, then the planet will be resilient. And in fact, miracles of healing are possible when we align ourselves with the healing forces of nature and the, the basic tendency of nature toward wholeness, mm. which is what we've been fighting for thousands of years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what I really appreciated about your perspective is that instinct for holism, instinct for systems thinking, instinct for looking at interconnectedness, and so that we don't just look at climate in terms of the air, or, okay, we'll take into account the oceans as well. You actually see the whole biosphere as interconnected and, 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 and being fully conscious of that, and then also how... Uh, we have been living a story of separation which helps us to a, a sort of somehow legitimize or not even think about the way we treat each other and the planet uh which and if that doesn't shift then we'll we'll, we'll keep causing harm so i i am um, i've really appreciated that that holistic perspective which therefore invites us out of the idea that oh climate change is just some annoying little side effect that we have to fix uh, right. through through technologies and through whatever you know some policies to reduce carbon emissions so i i've really appreciated that what do you think are the the risks or the dangers of when people are waking up to how scary climate change is right now more so than ever before but without really the mainstream discourse mainstream media or mainstream climate scientists really inviting the kind of holistic perspective that that you've shared what are the dangers yeah. of that? Thank you for that softball question. Uh, I think that the, that the danger is that we jump into solutions out of a kind of an urgency and out of a partial understanding that, that, are actually, that actually make the situation worse. For example, biofuels. Um, today I'm going to talk to a Romanian activist who is pretty upset about like the convoys of logging trucks taking Europe's last old growth forest to the wood chipping plant to be burned in converted coal plants that then get carbon credits for sustainable energy. So like biofuels taking over enormous tracts of land in Africa, Asia, and South America to convert the world into fuel or big hydro projects that are also draining like the last expanse of wetlands in Africa in the inner Niger Delta to 
create so-called carbon neutral electricity or even like solar panels and electric vehicles and stuff. I was just reading about um, a silver mine in Mexico that covers 100 square kilometers uh, that has just eaten into the mountains, destroyed pretty much every living thing on those 100 square kilometers, has a, <clears throat> has a um, like several square kilometer waste pond surrounded by a, a wall 50 stories high to contain all of the toxic waste that then of course sinks into the groundwater table. Um, and the article I read said in order to produce enough silver to meet all of, to convert fully to, um, uh, you know, off fossil fuels, we need 130 mm -hmm. mines like that just for silver, not to mention right. cobalt, not to mention copper, you know, um, molybdenum, et cetera. So, so that's a big challenge to the, yeah. the eco-modern idea of progress and our ability to control nature in a way that means that we can fix this. That's a huge yeah. uh, and, and is that what we want? mathematical challenge to that. Right, and even if we it? could do it, is that what we want? To find some right. way to continue civilization as we have known it. Isn't our protest about that? Like, even if we could continue powering it, do we want to? Or, or like this part of me that, that kind of wants climate change to happen, to rescue us, to say, now we have to change all the things that I've wanted to change, which is our entire civilization. Now, now maybe we have to change them. I think that this is actually a false hope that we're going to be forced to change by survival, because I think that the initiation that we're being offered is outside of valuing the earth for our own survival or our own well-being, but to relate to it as a sacred being in and of itself. Interesting, because a lot of people, I think perhaps the, the big shift in Western understanding of climate change in the last couple of years is, is that sense of personal vulnerability. Uh, we've, for those of us who've paid attention, know that tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of people are being very badly affected by uh, disasters, whether it's drought, whether it's famine, which are made worse by extreme weather and, and climate change. But but they haven't themselves felt vulnerable. That they didn't think that this would actually be threatening the food on their own table within the coming decade, or at least within the coming few decades. So I am wondering how that growing awareness, it's still marginal, it's still quite niche, um, but it's being, it's spreading. Um, and also, you know, wildfires in, in California and in Australia is really ruining people's lives, really bringing that sense close to home in the West that this is dangerous to us, us being people um, in the West. Um, yeah, I was interested in how you move from that, if you can, to this um, place of reverence for nature, this resacralization of, and this, and, of nature and this wonder of being alive and of life and this desire to serve life and commune with life. Is it possible? I, I think it's possible only by connecting people to experiences of beauty and loss, because that's mm -hmm. what opens the doorway back to love. I, I was remembering recently one of the formative experiences I had in becoming an environmentalist or an earth lover. I don't know what word I'm allowed to use now, uh, but I was with my family on a vacation to Yellowstone Park and my father and I hiked, you know, deep into the wilderness there. And we came upon this pristine lake and, and or a big pond. Um, and there were like three or four young men who and there were these otters in the pond, in the lake, beautiful, these beautiful otters. And the three and four young men were amusing themselves by taking stones and hurling them into the lake to try to hit the otters. And like my father couldn't, these were big guys, you know, he wasn't going to intervene. And like the sense of helplessness and despair 
Mm. It wasn't because I made some self-interested calculation that this was somehow going to harm me. It was a feeling of, of, of alienation from the human species and, and this anger and grief that had no easy target. I mean, I could hate these young men, but eventually like, you know, why are they doing it? You know, what's the, what's, what has cut us so cut us off from empathy that we can treat the world as a pile of, uh, as a plaything or a spectacle or a pile of instrumental things. That's the origin of the problem. And I don't think that more cleverly deploying what we see as natural resources is going to get anywhere near the root of the problem. So I think mm. that there's an imperative to connect people with love of earth and not to try to scare them into love because that's not how I came by it. And I, even though a lot of people say, well, you know, I became concerned about climate change because of these um, threats to my own well-being. I'm not sure if that's the truth. Maybe for some people it is, but lived experience tells us as a collective that our well-being is fine, that there's plenty of food, um, that we can, that technology can, you know, even if we ruin the soil, we can grow it in hydroponics factories. I met this guy who has devised ways to grow oysters that never have to be in the ocean, like cathodes for oysters. Um, then there's the, the um, uh, meat cells that are grown in vats, you know, uh, artificial meat. Like, what if we continue down this path? Yeah, I, I think I was scared into love. Uh, I think um, that my, my de delving into the climate science in 2018 and having this sense of shock just at how bad this is, how soon this is, and how it's quite likely to affect those I love and know and the places I know and love and, and me. Um, I, I think I did, I did that, that did sort of lead to a despair, which meant that the only way out of it was, 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 was with love, with openness, with vulnerability. Um, and quite a lot of people I've met who then became involved in Extinction Rebellion also. It's, it's that, that the fear and the grief transforming them um, through a period of despair. But that still is a few people, a few people who've managed to have the time to go into this. And I, I do wonder what, whether that's something that, what's going to happen at, at, at a large scale, the general public's waking <laughs> up to uh, vulnerability uh, for themselves and their own societies. Um, and for me, that's, uh, that's an open question and, and I'm quite worried about it. And that's quite, quite a lot of the work I've been doing is sort of how can we uh, help people to, um, to, to, to see the possible worst, but in a way that then doesn't lead to um, uh, the kind of response, which is anger and blame, which might make things worse. And I was wondering about that with you because there are some angry earth lovers out there. Um, Greta is amazing, but she also is very clear when she says to politicians, I will not forgive you. And I know from reading your book, you're, you're inviting us through this holistic perspective to, it also sounds quite Taoist, you know, and, and Buddhist in as well, or at least has some resonance with that, that, um, well, if I was, had their life experience, I might make the same decisions. And so blame is, is, blame doesn't really take us anywhere as well. I was wondering what your thoughts are mm -hmm. on the rise of activism, how it's fueled by anger, how people do feel really angry at, say, politicians in COP25 in Madrid right now. Not, you know, they're seeing yeah. this, how bad things are, and they're, they're not seeming to manage to make a difference that would matter. So there is yeah. that frustration and anger and blame and finger pointing. I was wondering what you, 
when you yeah. see that, hear that from people, how do you respond? I think it's based on a misdiagnosis of the problem. We, we live in, in various cultural stories that can hijack primal emotions. Like, so a story hijacks grief and diverts it onto despair and paralysis. A story hijacks anger and diverts it onto hatred. And the story basically says that this is happening because of these bad people. And therefore, they pre it pre presents a false target and a false uh, solution blueprint that if we could only tear down, take down, uh, or, or, <clears throat> or dominate those bad people and, and put ourselves in their position, then we would be able to make a better world. But if you look at what happens if, if, a, if a politician even does something as tepid as to increase fuel prices, the result is instant riots and, and civil unrest because people in society in, in many places are just on the edge and they can't even, they can't live their lives and pay more for fuel. Like the system, I see the leaders as puppets and functionaries of a system. Mm -hmm. And if you installed yourself in their position, you might find that you can't actually do much different than they do. Not that there is nothing that a leader can do or nothing that anybody can do, but I've come to understand it as, as what's useful is to invite people to the edge of their courage. What's the natural next step? Okay. And perhaps anything that we could demand is not near enough which means that we don't actually know how to solve this problem. Not knowing how to solve the problem, and, or I would say knowing that we don't know how to solve the problem is a huge improvement over thinking that we know how to solve the problem by leveling our psychological force on the leaders. I will never forgive you, shame on you, how could you? Yeah. Like that's a false solution that pretends that they have a power that they do not have. So it's, it's politically futile, I think. And okay, so you would, yeah. uh, you would invite more creative thinking in, say, the Extinction Rebellion movement at the moment, rather than going back with demands to government. Keep those, well, but also think about something else. We've seen this story before. You, you, you make demands that somebody cannot fulfill, you, that automatically turns them into an adversary. And then you end up, you know, pretty soon, like the, the, this self-righteousness is justified by some act of police brutality. And then the protests become about the protests and not about the issue anymore. It becomes mm -hmm. about the, the government response to it and are we justified? And then the black bloc comes in and, and it gets, you know, there's some segment of it that gets violent. And then eventually the public is alienated from the movement. This is what happened. This has happened many, many times. And I don't, I don't want to see this, this um, profound energy of protest and um, of alienation from the, the, the way that the world has been to be so, diverted so onto that. On that one then, what I want to ask, because I know from your book and from, our com uh, from your previous work and our previous conversations that you have really sunk into this about, wow, well, given that so many things don't work and we don't really know uh, how to address a, the myriad problems of which climate is one that come from humanity living in an age of separation. Um, so, so what will work or what might work? Now, I know you have some ideas on that and... Uh, yeah, and you write about it on your blog. I wonder if you could say what your um, what you think does or might work, and also um, anything about your confidence on that or not. Whether it's more mm -hmm. like you're sensing into it, or whether you actually feel absolutely this is certain that this way yeah. that you believe in will work. 
Okay, there's uh, maybe I'll talk to two two different levels of it. On one level, it's to change the story, the story of separation, the story of the separate individual, the story of good versus evil, the story of human versus nature, um, the story that holds full beingness in human beings alone and says that the world is just this complicated object. Uh, but to move into a story of interbeing, a story that understands earth as alive and even conscious and sacred, that understands sacredness to be a property of matter, not infused from the outside by spirit and not absent altogether, not a mere human projection, like to really come back to the world. As a result of that, this, you know, this sounds philosophical, but it translates into very practical, a very practical reordering of priorities for the environmental movement. Because when we understand, and this is what I referred to at the beginning, Earth as a living being, then the most important thing becomes, and, and for me, this is the top priority. I kind of ordered it into four priorities. So the top priority from this paradigm is to protect any remaining pristine ecosystems, especially the Amazon and the Congo rainforest, which is being destroyed even faster than the Amazon, and any pristine ecosystem uh, on Earth, because these are where Gaia's memory of health is still intact. And if they can be preserved, there will always be hope. Health can radiate back out from these um, uh, refugia. So, and you know, you can also look at that from a carbon perspective in terms of sequestration and so forth. I think a more valuable perspective is the water perspective, how the, the big rainforests mm -hmm. anchor the global water cycle uh, and bring rain so, into the, yeah. Yeah, so, so changing the story will also, uh, yeah, help fo refocus priorities. Uh, right. So again, that relates to what you're talking about, the, or the, the sort of the organ failure of the planet. So you, but, um, but I'm also interested in, in then when you're talking to a bunch of activists, then what, what is that? Or all people, just ordinary people who want to align their lives with their values and their concern mm -hmm. for the environment, including how appalling climate change now looks. What, yeah. What's the... I mean, it depends saying, if, uh, if I'm talking to people, if they're, in a, if, if they're in like a policy conversation, as in what yeah. should we do as a collective, um, that's a different conversation than what should I do personally. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm kind of addressing the what should we do and therefore maybe if I'm politically active, what should I do as a political citizen? And so the, those are the, the four priorities are from that perspective. And then I could also go into uh, a more personal level for people who are not drawn to political action. So do you, do you want me to, to do the other three priorities or? Well, I'm interested in particular in um, the, in, in some of your writings, you talk about how um, loving actions that have nothing obviously to do with the environment, caring for mm -hmm. a neighbor or a sick loved one. Uh, I don't know if you say definitely or may have an impact uh, on environmental conservation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, for many people, a real stretch of this idea of, of non-separation. And, mm -hmm. and, and I was thinking if you could say that or something about that yeah. and, and how that, and how that also maybe how that's landing with people and uh, yeah. Yeah. As a philosophy. Yeah. So one way to approach that is to ask where, where does our ecocidal civilization draw its energy from? Like what, what, why are we destroying all life on earth? Why, what, why are we, we um, focused on GDP and money and domination? Like, where's this coming from? Why do people overconsume? What, what's powering this? Is it that we're just bad? Or is it that there, is an, there are deep unmet needs that are built into our society that then reach for the substitutes that are available through consumption and through domination. Like what's the, what's the root cause of our entire way of life? Mm. And I think that it is in part 
the story of who we are and the trauma that we have endured um, living in the systems built on that story. And therefore, anything that we do that dissolves the story of separation, anything that we do that meets the unmet needs for belonging, for community, for connection, for meaning, um, anything that we do to meet these needs is going to recast our political vision. It's going to um, uh, soften the craving for the substitutes for these needs. If you have a deep experience of belonging and connection and intimacy, you don't want to go shopping anymore. You don't want a big house and a big car. Uh, and, and you don't need to go on exotic vacations across the world to, um, to, to compensate for what's missing. So we can see our world destroying ways as symptoms and then look for the causes and meet the causes. Mm. And then like on an intuitive level, I think that, that we understand that, for example, a society that locks up its most vulnerable members, exploits its most vulnerable members, that uh, dehumanizes vast swaths of the population it will necessarily be a society that mistreats and denies and dehumanizes and, and dismisses and exploits the most vulnerable places on earth and the most vulnerable beings on earth. It's all part so, of the same matrix. So if all the people that who hear of your work uh, and read your book and so on, um, have the loving, their own inner loving nature affirmed through hearing that and try to be more conscious about showing up in the world in every moment in, with an open heart and, and, and not living that story of separation. Um, how can that ripple, either physically or metaphysically, at sufficient scale and pace to um, address our climate emergency or address the trashing of the Congo and the Amazon right now? Really? And what if it can't? Does that matter? I'd like to say that, okay, there's a lot of questions there. Um, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how somebody's lonely work with homeless people or with prisoners or with dying people is going to change humanity's relationship to the biosphere quickly enough to avert further catastrophe. I like to say that it's already too late and it's never too late. Both are true. Um, I mean, there's, you know, we live, J.B. McKinnon, the naturalist says we live in a 10% world. Um, less than 10% of the whales, 10% of the fish, 1% of the virgin forests in North America, et cetera. Like it's already too late. There's been a lot of extinction already and a lot of mm. cultural extinction and a lot of human suffering. And <clears throat> I think that we have a tendency to take the energy of urgency, which is a yearning to align ourselves with our purpose on earth and translate that into hurry. There's a, an appeal to you know, 12 years or four years or whatever Guy McPherson's saying now, however many years till human extinction. And we have to do something right now. I have become skeptical of those, of those narratives of especially runaway global warming narratives, you know, powered by methane feedback loops and all that kind of stuff. I'm not ignorant of, of those um, paradigms, but I've been around and following this issue since the 1980s. I became aware of climate change in the mid 80s, actually, before, I mean, you know, I was, I was tuned into it a long time. And, and you know, I remember the, 
the predictions of, you know, Manhattan being under 50 feet of water, you know, by 2020. I remember, you know, predictions of snow-free winters, you know, an ice-free Arctic by 2013, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think that the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to invest too much mm -hmm. trust into those scientific predictions. Do you, and, do you, yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, I mean, this is a lot of directions, but I want to um, hold to the urgency that for me is present whether or not those predictions are true. Mm. It does, my, my urgency does not depend on global warming even happening. Like I, and in fact, I think we could, I mean, I don't know, because I've, I read both sides of the science and I've become adept at arguing both sides to the satisfaction of their partisans. But I don't know, like maybe the skeptics are right. Maybe the sun has a big inf in impact. Maybe we're facing another ice age. Right. I don't, so you, I don't know. So you believe there's a way of living, as a way of letting go of stories of separation, as a way of being fully connected with life in its fullness that, that can be lived right now. And if yeah. you were going to die tomorrow or die in 30 years, and if the world was going to continue or blow up tomorrow, that's true and real for, for you. It, that, yeah. The urgency here's, is in that rather than any predictions yes. about the future. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Yeah. Anything that we do in service to life is a prayer for life. It's an alignment to a world that's becoming more and more alive. Anything that we do in service to death, anything we do from a perception of the world as a thing is an invitation for the world to move more and more to death. And I believe that these prayers are heard, that there's a morphic field that ripples out from any choice that we make, mm -hmm. that operates in mysterious ways. So, and no act is wasted. Mm -hmm. And this is. And we don't know whether it's it, 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 with the morphic field. I mean, it might it might not be wasted, but it might not save this civilization, or even might not save Homo sapiens. But it might yeah. constitute a, a ripple towards a magical, loving connection, wherever, whenever. I mean, because when you're Maybe. talking at that level. It's, it's, but, but I do think that is, civilization is going through a, an initiation part of the, and the initiation is into, uh, from childhood, um, where we just play around with our gifts and take from the parent into adulthood, where we enter a reciprocal relationship with the lover and we use our gifts for their true purpose, which is service to life, which is what all other species on earth do and all ecosystems do in addition to um, growing uh, all trees also positively impact the forest. The, the fungi, the bacteria, all of them give a gift in addition to just surviving. Humanity is supposed to do that too if we are to become a mature species. We, we, we enter the universal principle of life is in service to life. Does anyone ever said that maybe that is to assume <clears throat> progress and progress is part of the age of separation because it's moving into a linear concept of, 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 of humanity and actually maybe, um, you know, civilization collapsing and, and, it, and us passing away is, is a possibility. Why, why do we need to think that there will be a um, something greater that humans are part of something. Why, why do we need that sense of always going well, forward? It's a very different conception of progress than we're used to. Progress has meant progress in the domination of all others. But why mm. need progress at all? Because why, in why nature, do we need to believe that there's a, a, a why, why can't, why, why can't there be just amazing beauty and love amongst us all because the world's going to shit and then we all die out and that is totally divine and sacred as a process why do we need progress why does that could happen any... yeah I'm, I'm just observing um patterns patterns okay. of uh coming of age uh patterns of 
uh, an ecosystem reaching maturity. And I'm seeing that humanity as a collective, as a civilization, has not reached its adulthood. So we might fail to make it through this uh, initiation. In traditional cultures, sometimes a young man would not pass his initiation as if in, in the physical, he might have died in the initiation and that would not be considered a failure. If this crisis brings us mm -hmm. to, uh, to love, to interconnection, to the elevation of beauty, to compassion and we perish, that's okay. But yeah, I think that- We have a yeah. lot of patterns of that with people facing terminal illness and yes. having the most amazing loving experiences with, with their family as, as they face death. But I also yeah. know that, that what we believe to be possible is a very tiny, uh, narrow sector of what is actually possible. And our understanding of possibility is based on what is fundamentally a Newtonian story and a story of separation about how the world works. But I have seen and heard firsthand and many secondhand and thirdhand stories of for example, uh, the woman in Hong Kong who was in organ failure, stage four cancer, going into a coma, had a spiritual experience and was up from her bed three days later in a totally unexplainable healing. If that can happen to a human body, what's possible for the body politic? What's possible for the ecological body? And how does that, how, how do those things happen? And how do we enter the reality in which those things happen. Part of the entrance into the reality is through our choices that declare who we are and what reality shall be. Therefore, the, the seemingly invisible choices are prayers that have unsuspected power. Yes, thank you. Well, that's, uh, I thank also everyone who's been uh, holding on with questions for Charles. I kind of hogged uh, more Sorry than I normally that. do. I, I was, no, I mean, it was me. It was me. I wanted to have more time with you than I normally have with our guests. So um, I'm going to hand over to uh, people asking questions now. We have one from Karen. If you could say where in the world you are and uh, put your video on. If anyone who's asking a question, we need you to have your video on. Otherwise, things go blank on the video. Um, Karen, are you there? Um, what? And uh, Matthew, why have we got Karen? I've only got Karen showing up without any vo vo noise or anything. Okay, let's move on then. Um, instead, uh, Harris, okay, have you got a question now? <coughs> Please have your video and your audio on. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very good. Yes. Okay, um, I'll try to make it brief and stick to the original question is, it's fine and good and talk in framing the problem as, as a spiritual one, but it's worth remembering that if we're going to take it to the spiritual dash philosophical, it's taking us 2000 years of Christianity, um, 500, uh, 300 years of capitalism and 500 years of Western science, and we're at the situation where we are. So um, what, is, what are the prospects of changing this really quickly in less than you know, three figures? Why not frame it as a social problem? And that takes us back to like in terms of democracy and protests. Mm -hmm. is that, isn't that more po yeah. po feasible? That's a question. Yeah, the problem is that our social systems our political institutions, our economic institutions, I mean, that's something we haven't even talked about. Those are built on the, the philosophical and spiritual story of separation. And they reinforce the story of separation. The story creates the system and the system creates the story. So that together they are a gestalt, you know, they're like a, a being that I think, believe is reaching its, reaching a, 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 its senescence, reaching its it, um, old age and becoming very fragile. So the <clears throat> initiation I'm speaking of, part of that is a process of breakdown, a breakdown in our sense making, the way that we make meaning about the world, you know, in the story, and also a breakdown in the systems built atop that story. 
every time that there is a um, crisis, like where the breakdown is starting to happen, we have a choice. Do we accept this initiation? Do we let go of it? Or do we hold on to it a bit tighter and try to keep the thing going? We will receive a series of invitations of this kind in the form of worsening crises. So for me, it is actually a political act to propagate a, a, a new story and to propagate the kinds of experiences that co-resonate with that story so that we no longer are so afraid of stepping into the new, so that we're no longer so, so desperate to cling on to what's familiar because we have um, another story about who we are and what the world could be. And we have experiences that come from that story that tell us it's okay. Life could be even better. We don't have to hold on anymore. Thank you. So there's a, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have a question also from Elizabeth about uh, rituals of, of, of healing. Um, Matthew, can you select uh, Elizabeth from, uh, Matthew asked us to look through all the list and, and turn on Elizabeth's uh, video. And there we go, Elizabeth Daniels. <clears throat> Hi. Oh, thank you? you. I live in Wales, West Wales, St. David's, okay. West Wales. So um, we have a, I was thinking of a, a kind of recipe. We have, um, this is a site of pilgrimage. Um, we, it is also, we have an abundance of holy wells here. And I'm really thinking about how to create rituals, including those, that recipe. Um, so will actually heal and make a difference to the abundance of the, you know, to encourage the abundance of the planet and to help people make changes as well. So, um, yes, I'm planning one of these. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of looking for ideas, really, uh, of, of how to, well, what to do. I'd love to know your response to this very big um, mm -hmm. ask. Yeah. I, in my book, I described an encounter I had with some Dogon, uh, this ancient wisdom lineage from Africa, Mali. And uh, I asked them about climate change. And they said, ha ha ha, you Westerners don't understand climate change at all. You think that the cause is greenhouse gases, but actually the cause is a disruption in the ceremonial covenant between humans and the rest of life and the planet. And every time that you dig up artifacts that were put with the appropriate ceremonies at special places on the earth and move them to museums in New York and London, you are causing untold disruption. And when you cease doing the ceremonies in the places they are meant to be done, you are causing confusion in the earth that no longer knows how to take care of us. So you gotta start you got to put the artifacts back and start doing ceremonies again. This is difficult to translate into the IPCC report. This, there's a gulf between these two vastly different ways of understanding the earth. But there's also a unifying point, which is that <clears throat> whether you're talking about permaculture and regenerative agriculture, which is the topic that Jem wouldn't let me get into, um, but that was the number two priority, regeneration, or you're talking about earth shrines and ceremony, they both come from a common source, which is to see the earth as a being and to ask, who are you? What is your dream? What do you want? What's my right interaction with you? To see them as a being. And then to, to, to from that question, like where do you think that indigenous rituals came from? They came from a relationship. They arise from an asking. They don't say we made up our rituals. They say we received our rituals. We received our myths. We received our knowledge. To receive it, you have to be in relationship to that which can give it. And so maybe if you want to uh, restore a sacred relationship to the land, the first thing to do is simply to observe and to listen and not to to 
exclude those rituals that are part of modern technology. Like one of the rituals might be a compost heap uh, or you know, something that, that the rational mind could accept. And some of those rituals might be totally, you know, something that came to you in a dream and you have no idea why you should build your grape arbor with sacred geometric proportions and why it needs to have crystals here, here, and here, and why you have to do it on the full moon. Like you might have, your, your listening and observation might give you information that doesn't fit into a, what we would call a rational uh, framework, but not to exclude those things either. It's all coming from, what, what do you need? How can I contribute to your livingness? to your beauty, land, place, water, how can I contribute? And, and accepting all of the information that resonates with that intention. That's where ceremony and shrine uh, and, and, and prayer comes from. Thank you. Um, a question now from Eric Gaza. Please say where you are in the world. Uh, Matthew, you need to switch on um, find and switch on Eric. Yep. Uh, okay. Yeah, Eric, I'm in Burlington, Vermont. I think I've had Charles on my podcast a couple years ago. Um, uh, the question I was going to ask is, well, first of all, grateful that you're kind of looking at this from a spiritual perspective, and I've enjoyed reading a lot of your books. What role do you think, you know, ancient trauma plays in maybe creating and perpetuating the story of separation? Um, yeah. It, I mean, we all probably at this point understand how trauma is passed down genetically um, through the generations and passed down culturally too. Those who are traumatized end up becoming perpetrators themselves and how the experience of trauma contributes and, and justifies the story of separation. It tells us, yeah, the world is a hostile place. Yeah, we are amongst competitors who don't care about ourselves. Yeah, there's no, no trust. There's no empathy. So, so they, they are a result and a cause of the story of separation. And they also impact the land where they happen. They, they cause great pain to the earth, especially mass trauma, concentration camps and sites of massacres and things like that. Um, and that just, I, I guess I, I say that to validate all of our healing endeavors even when they don't seem to impact carbon dioxide levels in any measurable way, in any way that you could trace a causal link. They're part of the, uh, they're part of the prayer of healing. They're part of the return, the reunion. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, yeah, okay. Yeah. I was wondering on that, Charles, about how does one, so I, I love this notion of actions as prayer uh, and, and just how we are in, in our daily lives rather than just sitting and praying. Um, but I also am I'm aware of some philosophies of prayer where, where just prayers of petition, like please God fix X or please divine mysterious force I don't understand, fix Y or heal my friend. Those are, those are not in necessarily in surrender to the, the mysterious unity. And there's a sort of a way of saying, I surrender to the mysterious unity. And this is how I feel. And this is what I wish. And if it is to be, please may it be. That sort of balance between surrender and request. I wonder, does with that in mind, how how does one 
live a prayer of 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 serving serving life rather than death in in one's actions and choices okay If you really mean what you say when you pray, if it is meant to be, let there be healing. Then when the moment comes for you to contribute to that, if you meant it, then you will take that opportunity. So you could look at prayers of petition actually as prayers of alignment and preparation, as a declaration to unify yourself with the world that you are praying for when and maybe if you pray for you know a certain person's healing maybe you will have an opportunity like if you prayed for that and then the next day they call and say hey i really need you know some some chicken broth can you come and bring it over you say no 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 i already prayed for your healing i'm not going to do that <laughs> like it probably wasn't a sincere prayer yeah, I haven't met anyone. Who, I okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah. but, but, so you might be called upon to actually align your actions with what you said you wanted, mm -hmm. but maybe you won't. Maybe this person's across the world, but maybe the next day or the next week or the next year, you have an opportunity to serve somebody else's healing. And in a way, they're kind of a proxy because you're not only praying for one person's healing. You're, you're wanting a healed world. So basically a prayer is a declaration of what the world shall be and who you want to be in that world. And the, the alignment of our actions with that tell us if we really meant the prayer or not. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go to Betty now. Uh, Betty, please say where, where in the world you're joining us from and then ask Charles your question. Um, hi, I'm in Cheltenham. Oops. Um, I'm seeing Brennan Smith, but can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, very well. <laughs> um, I'm in Cheltenham in the UK. Um, and um, yeah, what I find most frustrating at the moment is that I'm just con constantly aware of the fact that whatever I do, just by existing in this world, in this society, I contribute to the problem. There is no way around it. Every time I turn the heating on every time I switch the light on every time I have a shower every time I go to the supermarket and buy food I'm contributing to the problem and it, how do I reconcile with that that's my question <laughs> thank you yeah So I guess I'm, I'm curious what, um, where the pain of that recognition is coming from. One place that it can come from is like, it, it dissolves any idea that we have that, that we're a good person because look what I'm doing. Um, and, and that's not really why we're here, though, <laughs> to be a good person. We're here to serve from wherever we've been placed to serve, the, to serve life, which now means the healing of the planet and the healing of society, as best we are able, given where we have been placed. So for me, like, okay, talk about contributing to the problem. I mean, here we are communicating over the internet. And I don't know if you've looked into the, uh, you know, energy and resources associated with even having a video conference call, but we are in this moment um, drawing on Earth's health in order to have this conversation. The reason that I'm doing it is because I believe that these conversations are part of the healing. 
I'm not going to try to perform a calculation that say that the good outweighs the harm, because that would only be possible if we could quantify both good and harm. And that would, that would mean that we know how the, the healing is going to happen, but we don't know. We have to be guided by something else. We have to be guided by our impulses that come through our connection to what we love and care about. Sometimes those impulses do not make sense in a metrics mindset, in a point of view of quantifying benefits and costs. But what else are we going to listen to? So just as, I don't know, Greta Thunberg says, I will never forgive you. I'd like to offer the opposite. Where does forgiveness come from? Forgiveness is not an act of indulgence. Forgiveness comes from recognizing the totality of somebody's circumstances. To forgive another is to say, yeah, now that I understand, I know that I may have done what you did if I were in your shoes. Forgiveness happens when it's not even necessary because you understand where it's coming from. And the same is true of forgiveness of self. That, yeah, in these circumstances, I, I mean, yeah, I could conceivably go off into the woods and, and live in a little hut and, and subside, subsist off, off roots and berries or some, and have a zero carbon impact. But is that really going to help the world? How do I know what is going to help the world? I don't think that the story that we've inherited provides the answer to that. And we said we're offered substitutes for the answer, some kind of carbon arithmetic or something like that, or some kind of ethical calculus that, that attempts to answer the question, what is the right thing to do? And I don't think that that navigation system is reliable anymore. So for me, it's not about minimizing harm. It's about attunement to what is in service to life. Whatever form that's taking, it might take the form of flying to see my mother who's ailing, who has cancer. I cannot justify that in terms of carbon. She's gonna die anyway. What impact is that gonna have on the future? But there's something in me that knows that this is actually really significant. And that is coming, that air flight is coming from a very different place than the air travel that might come from an ambition uh, or an unmet need that really wants to be met by community and belonging and intimacy, but instead I'm you know, flying off to Disneyland. It's coming from a different place. And, and this is part of ending the war on nature is to end the war on the self and end the war on desire and to trust that if we really tune into our desires, our impulses, then we will be tuning into our true purpose, which is to serve life on earth. Thank you. Wow, and we've had an hour together, Charles. Um, but before we uh, end our, our, our call, I wanted to ask you a little bit about deep adaptation. So this is, uh, everyone who's joined you today is a member of the professions network of the, the Deep Adaptation Forum. And we haven't talked before about it, but it's, it's, it's a philosophy premised on the expectation of quite imminent societal collapse in my, many parts of the world. So people who join the forum see that a societal collapse is either inevitable, likely, or already unfolding, and they wish to engage with each other actively, curiously, compassionately, and creatively, positively, from that premise, rather than seeing it as a premise which is uh, late inviting apathy, or uh, is about defeat, or is about uh, a, a mean view of human nature or possibility. <laughs> so it's like, what is, if, we, if you take that, what is, what is where, where can creativity go after that? So we often talk about enabling loving responses to that predicament. Uh, and, um, and 
it's been an incredible experience for me seeing how much courage people have to actually say, yeah, I think this is a future and I want to, I want to stay engaged to try and reduce harm, to support meaning making and find joy and give us as best chance as we've got for whatever could, uh, whatever kind of human society and whatever kind of natural world can be sustained. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, have you, has this come across your uh, path and, and what are your thoughts on that, that framing? Yeah, uh, I, it has because I, I do kind of, you know, stay in touch with your work. I think that, that what you're doing is valuable, whether or not societal collapse is, in, is imminent. And if it takes the perception of societal collapse to, to push people past the veil of normalcy into an extraordinary intention, then that's great. Um, And paradoxically, it may be um, that, that it may exactly be letting go of any hope that we're going to avoid collapse that will enable us to avoid collapse. Because what has to happen to avoid collapse is exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. The um, awakening of, of, of love and, and the finding of joy and service without any guarantee that it's ever going to make a difference can't remember the exact words you used, but yeah, it's it's yeah. that's good to hear that because it's what I'm seeing is that that people are thinking, wow, I realize so much of the story of self, or the ways I conform, and have conformed my whole life, are because of this deep and unconscious respect and acceptance of this society, its values, what it tells me to believe in, what it tells me to aspire to, what it tells me to be afraid of. And that collapses. That's what's collapsing for people. And therefore they're, they're finding a new fearlessness to, mm -hmm. to put love and truth first in, in the present moment, come what may. Uh, now, not everyone will respond in that way. And obviously I'm concerned and, uh, you know, obviously some people can respond in ways which are tell me where to run, tell me where's the gun, uh, let's mm -hmm. stop those refugees coming and, and, and that kind of typical prepper response. But I'm right. finding with the deep adaptation space, there's more of that, um, what you've just described, that, that, that uh, the veil of normalcy goes and people ask deep questions about what's truly important in their life. Yeah, the typical prepper response creates exactly what it's afraid of. It is totally, like, how do I survive? How, you know, it's about me separate from the world. And that energizes the template and the morphic field of me against the world of separation. It mm -hmm. creates what it, what, it, what it fears. And it sounds like you're not really coming from fear. You're using this possibility or maybe you see it as a likelihood or a certainty as a gateway to the morphic field of interbeing, truth and love. And that deactivates the uh, various collapsist and Armageddon timelines. Yeah, well, we... Yeah. Uh... It certainly uh, feels uh, the right kind of conversations for me to be having. Um, it's been quite a surprise, the explosion of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, and wonderful to see that people are not then immediately going for the typical prepper attitude, but staying curious, staying compassionate uh, and creative. Charles, and for thank the record, you very much. Oh, I'll say What's for the record, record? like I, I do think that um, we are facing as a society profound breakdowns in you know four years. Um, so we're back to Boris. 
Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back and forth. <laughs> you know, when, when, when you see it coming, you hold on a little tighter. Uh, that's one of that's part of the letting go process, actually, is to hold on a little tire, tighter and to try to make America great again, to try to make to make the old normal come back. It's part of the process uh, and a fairly late stage of the process. So maybe it's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, but I just wanted to say that that collapse may not look anything like we think it looks like. And I am quite certain that that it doesn't necess necessarily mean billions of casualties, although that is a possibility as well. But I, I don't have I, more time to, yeah, to no, expand I'm, I'm on that. I'm with you on that. I, I believe yeah. in the more beautiful collapse our hearts know is possible. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. And thanks, thanks everyone Jeff. else for joining. And uh, sorry for those people who couldn't ask questions, but I hope you found this useful. And uh, yeah, I hope to uh, meet up again one day, Charles, in person. Thank you very much. Definitely. Bye-bye. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you.